Please, Ariel, and you can just admit them as they come. Could I please ask that those who are not on mute, could they please mute? Getting some feedback there. Right, three, two, one. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to you all. We seem to be having some reception difficulties, and I hope that they will soon be something of the past. Really wonderful to have you all here this morning, our members and our partners, and it is indeed thanks to the support from you folk that we are able to continue having these events where we can keep you informed of current developments, uh, issues that are important to you and your business. It is a privilege for us this morning to welcome Mr. Benang Mushlali, who really needs no introduction. A highly respected South African businessman who is known as much for his patriotism and his active role in seeking to advance his country's interests and our agenda as for the leading role he has played in companies such as Otis Elevators, Shell South Africa and South African Airways, amongst others. He is passionate about, amongst others, transformation, people development, constructive collaboration, and above all, integrity in both our personal lives and in our business lives. Bernang, what I've omitted purposely not to include in that list is your passion for mentorship and the development of our youth. It is something that emerges clearly and is an inspiration to so many. I've had the privilege of reading your book. May I remind you, you promised to sign it for me, and I'm sure that will happen as time permitting. <laughs> Thank you, Benang. So there will be an opportunity for questions. We could ask you to use the chat facility. Please send your questions through. Benang specifically wants an interaction session towards the end, and we have allowed time for that. So please send us your questions. We will also permit you to use the hand-raising facility. Uh, and we really hope that this will be a meaningful time for you as we are, are able to hear the deep insights and the constructive assessment of not only our current situation, but also the direction that we are embarked upon. So without any further ado, I hand over to you now. Mike, thank you very much. Just to make sure that um, you can hear me, correct, right? I'm receiving you loud and clear. Uh, everybody else, are we all good? Everybody receiving Benang loud and clear? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Yes, Thank you. Thanks very much. Lovely. With Thank that you. confirmation, you know, the value, the utility is in the dialogue, in the conversation, in the input, um, where we will really talk about things that are genuinely much more important to every single solitary one of us. But I thought, let me go to the beginning in trying to understand the status of where we are as a country, as a people with great natural endowments. And for me, I thought maybe the fifth state of the nation of the current president, Mata Melasira Ramaphosa, where he distilled and synthesized the four foremost overriding priorities and he said, number one, it's about defeating the coronavirus pandemic. Number two, he said, it's about accelerating our economic recovery. Thirdly, he said, we must implement our economic reforms to do two things, create sustainable jobs and drive this notion of an inclusive growth. Lastly, he said, we, might, we must fight corruption and strengthen the state, because it is much easier to deal with a capable state than the one that is less capable. Now, it's no accident that he started um, with a pandemic, because this happens once in 100 years. What really worries me at a personal level is that even though business has extended a hand to say, we want to work hand in glove with you because this is the single biggest risk that we are confronting. That input by business, the technical know-how, the ability to deliver this thing called project management, how to deliver mega projects on food, on time and on budget. SAB can deliver books to twice as many 
she beans as there are schools a week than government can do once a year to send books in Limpopo. When we want to move the Pfizer vaccine, that must be kept at minus 70 degrees Celsius. Americans call, call it centigrade. Um, Imperial has refrigerated trucks. Uh, a company that I'm associated with, the Bidvest Group Limited, they've got a logistics, a technical know-how. Uh, Discoveries Adrian Gore has 2 million members. If you gave them their vaccines, uh, Adrian Gore can vaccinate the 2 million members in one month. But yet in our plans, I don't get a sense that we are accepting that we are starting already behind. And let me uh, paint a little bit of a picture of what I mean when I say uh, behind. I mean, the president set us a herd immunity target of 67%. That's 40 million people. That's the entire adult population of the 60 million South Africans. In January, when this was announced, the run rate we should have been inoculating the South Africans is 100,000 a day every day. Had we done that in January, it would have taken us 400 days, which means we were only planning to finish vaccinating our people in June 2022. The Minister of Health set us a target that says would have inoculated 1.2 million frontline workers by the end of March. By the end of March, we were on 350,000 total. Today, we look at the run rate we should be doing. It should be 300,000 a day. And only two days ago, we said we are celebrating because we have exceeded the 1 million mark. At this rate, I think we are going to be found wanting because you see the vaccine rollout was always going to be a race. Because the country that can say, I've reached head immunity first, will be able to reap the pent up global tourism demand. Pre-COVID, South Africa's contribution by the tourism and hospitality industry was 9.8%. That's 10.2 million visitors. Now, the visits in 2020 are less than 3 million at 2.8 million. And that percentage has come down to 7.5% and going down. So when the world globally says almost 171 million total cases, 3.6 million deaths, in South Africa we say we are approaching 1.7 million total cases, 56 points six, so 56,646 people that have died as a direct result of the pandemic. And yet we know, the scientists tell us that the total people that have been exposed in South Africa, it's closer to 10 million. In fact, the number of deaths should be at least three times that. Because when you look at that component of unaccounted for deaths, um, there's 100,000 that has just happened in the 428 days that we've been in national lockdown. So South Africa is on 1.2% of the population that we wanted to get to at 67% in a year. I think even the end of 2022 now looks a little bit doubtful. And yet... For me, when I look at this thing called strategy, it's simply how to compete. And we compete at a country, at a business, and at an individual level. So when you look at the countries that have managed to inoculate more than 100% of their population, there's 11 of them. 
Most of them are islands, of, co- of course, Gibraltar at 226%, Seychelles, United Arab Emirates, the Falklands Islands, San Marino, etc. But if you compare ourselves with our BRICS counterparts, because we chose to be part of that block, and I look at the statistics on the 27th of January, and I look at only vaccine doses administered, Brazil was already on 579,000. Russia was already on 800,000. India, 2 million people, and China on 15 million people. Now we are in a spot of bother, and yet this company called Aspen that the president says will be able to manufacture locally and at least will get our Johnson's and Johnson's vaccine locally, it's the old Lennons in Kabecha, the old PE, that used to be owned 100% by this government. In fact, I can go further and say this government owns a company called BioVec, which is a biopharmaceutical company that is located in Cape Town since 2003. Why now are we talking about developing the capability to manufacture vaccines locally when we've had at least two that is owned by government. And most of the scientists that are helping globally actually come from here. It gets even worse when we compare ourselves with our African counterparts. So there's 54 African countries, 1.3 billion people that speak 3,000 languages with a continental GDP of 2.6 trillion US dollars. The biggest being Nigeria at 446, The second biggest is South Africa at 358, Egypt at 330 billion US dollars. 29 African countries are ahead of us in terms of inoculating their people. Only 26 are behind us. In fact, there are 22 countries that are open to vaccinated travelers in the world as we speak. So Charles de Gaulle, airport and London Heathrow are now opening their transatlantic flights. In Seville, in uh, maybe even not Madrid, because Madrid is the capital, you say it gets a lot of people. They are opening their beaches and nightclubs. Um, and, and, and people in London will be able to go to, to sporting uh, facilities. And yet our language, I find, does not have the required level of agency. And I think that's what worries me and should worry all of us. Let me, before I get to questions and comments, move to what then should be the role of business beyond just what you are doing, a business for South Africa, which is a creation of business unity South Africa. I think to be consistent, we've always spoken about doing six things before I pause. What drives the share price? It's this thing called rumor and speculation. Therefore, what is going to drive whether South Africa is absolutely able and capable is to address the lowest levels of confidence, trust and hope since the Second World War. I think we need to do four, no more than six things. You can't have a situation where people steal 1.4 trillion South African rands in four years of state capture when you speak about the nine wasted years and there are no consequences. Therefore, action number one to send a message that says we are open for business must be to send the top state capture miscreants uh, to jail. Of course, number two, we have to secure the vaccines because we secured 31 million Johnson & Johnson, 20 million from Pfizer, but we're also expecting 1.4 million from our COVAX program that will come through um, the African Union. Thirdly, I think we need to implement the socioeconomic reforms we've been talking about for the last 10 years. Fourth, I think we need to reduce our government debt. We must fix the more than 740 state-owned enterprises and state-owned companies. We must increase our infrastructure spend, especially in ports. The Durban port 
the World Bank gave us a report um, on Thursday that says we are the third from the bottom. The best port in the world is Singapore that was expelled by their parent Malaysia more than 50 years ago, and yet they managed to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps to be in the top five per capita incomes in the world. Lastly, I think we need to execute on this spectrum auction. Why are we not doing it? It's beyond me. We've been talking about digital migration for 10 years. Five ministers later, if you decide on a spectrum auction on Tuesday, on Friday, we bank 20 billion. Why we haven't done it? Honestly, again, for me, it defies logic. So we are poor by choice rather than by anything else. Where we are now, I look at poor Edward Kitzveta and say, the poor man collects on average 1.4 trillion South African rents through the South African Revenue Service, and yet 70% of that goes into three buckets. Public sector wage bills, social security, where there's 18 million people, when there's 16 million of us that are gainfully employed pre-COVID. Since then, we have lost net-net 2.2 million jobs, and of course, uh, lastly, debt. So debt servicing costs for us is 20 billion. In fact, our debt pre-COVID was 3 trillion. We are borrowing at the rate of 2.1 billion a day, every day. Our debt to GDP ratio, 93%. Excluding guarantees to SOEs and SOCs. If you include that, that's 110%. You see, it's not the percentage of debt in and of itself is our ability to pay. So the US of A can afford to be on 200% because they are able to service that debt. We couldn't even look at government to put the around of the figures, 250 million that was required to get us out to the COVID program. Business said we'll pay the first tranche, and they did. They said, government, you've got until the 15th of December to pay yours. They missed it, and we paid it on the 28th. <coughs> Uh, of December when we were already late. That's why we're in the COVAX program. Our deficit 2010 was 4%, now it's 16%. GDP growth last year was minus 7.5%. Forecast to grow at less than 3% in 2021. So it means we are planning only in 2024 to be at 2019 GDP levels. It's not going to help that our tax revenue is declining. We were Concerned that we might actually be 18% less. We're helped by the commodity prices, mostly from mining, and of course, our exports. But I think what should keep you and I awake at night is the fact that our unemployment rate was 32.5%. The last figures from Stats SA say <laughs> we're doing worse than that. And that's using the narrow definition of ILO that says those people that are looking for a job in the last 36 months. So we've been in lockdown for more than a year and a half. Um, of course, it will increase that number, which means that number actually is the best that it can ever be. But the one that really scares me is youth unemployment at 60%. And youth is 35 years and young. And by the way, it's the same percentage of the 60 million South Africans. 60% are below the age uh, of 35 uh, and the younger. So how does it manifest as I end, Mike? Where we are today when we look at the scandals that are associated with stealing uh, PPE money, accessing the 500 billion um, socioeconomic stimulus because of the pandemic, and without unpacking them in the interest of time, number one, I think our inequality is increasing, Mike. Racism is an, at an all-time high and widening. Black graduates are roaming the streets hopelessly. Public health care continue to fail the poor and the vulnerable. Public education has collapsed. And I think we need to take this notion of education seriously because it's the shortest way in which these young people can transcend social classes because through 20 24 years of hard work and application you could be born in alexander two kilometers across the bridge from the richest square mile in the continent called sentin 
and be able to afford a house in Bryanston. Not because you want a tender, but because you have earned, you deserve it, and you can afford it. Education matters because when one steadily bends the midnight oil, one gains access to the domain of knowledge and wisdom, the world of meaning, the world that cannot be conquered without a persistent crusade. You see, when you're dealing with educated people, you can't lie to them. Because only in Africa do the crooks regroup in order to loot again. And it is the youth that protects them and treats them as heroes. Mark, I'm hoping that lays a broad swath, a spectrum, a potpourri, a canvas on which we can have this, this dialogue. Thanks, Mark. But thank you so much for sharing your insights, as deep, constructive, and robust as they always are. Um, if I may, I'll take the prerogative to pose the first question to you. You are on record. You are on record saying that if government fails, business fails. You are on record as saying that. Is business doing enough to? align itself and forge a closer relationship with government in order to ensure that that doesn't happen? What is your perspective on that? Mike, you're absolutely correct. You know, when business does well, society generally does well. Business cannot continue to be an island of prosperity in a sea of poverty. So when we say business must create jobs, it's not jobs in and of itself. It's because when you create jobs as a business, you are actually creating markets of the future. There's a problem when your own employees cannot afford the goods and services that you provide. Where are you going to get those markets? In the, the US of A can afford to be arrogant because they've got 300 million people. Nigeria can afford to look internally, inward and focused, <laughs> self-centered and insular because it has 200 million people. South Africa, we only have 60 million. That's including the 5 million people of the 12 million Zimbabweans that are here, 2 million that are in Botswana. Therefore, when all of us are products of Ivy League universities and we learned that the purpose of business is shareholder maximization in the 21st century, it can be true because business must continue to do well by doing good. We saw BlackRock and Coronation in this country writing letters to the companies in which they invested, saying, we are now going to evaluate you on ESG. So we're moving away from an integrated report of the three Ps of planets, people, and profits in that order. We are now looking at the environment of societal and governance issues, because the definition of cooperative governance is the separation of ownership from control. I wish somebody could explain to our government this notion called role clarity and definition. What is the role of the shareholder? What is the role of the board? And what is the role of the executive? So that we're not stepping on each other's toes as it were. So let me conclude, Mike, by saying, let me posit the four or five things that should be the purpose of business in a pandemic. Number one is to survive, because if business can survive in a pandemic, you are already profitable, because a majority of large businesses are not going to see the, la the light of day. S small and medium enterprise have been totally pulverized and decimated. Three airlines that were owned by this government are dead and we're trying to resuscitate them. Eight-year-old award-winning South African Airways, 11,000 employees, its subsidiary Mengu, and indeed <clears throat> South African Express Airways that used to fly to 40 destinations just internally. When you include the Saku region, this entity was profitable for many years and we, we, we robbed it blind. Number two, I think business must bring about this notion of shared value. You see what keeps boards awake um, at night today is the fact that corporate decision-making should be consistent not only with the whims of the shareholders, but with a broader 
stakeholder community, the society in which you are located, the community in which you are based. Had we done that, Marika would not have happened because those executives passed through every morning and every afternoon through the informal settlement of Marika. And these are their colleagues. Thirdly, I think we need to ensure that business does no harm. Sounds passive. But every single soul to one of our employees have a right to leave their key relationships and significant others every morning with two hands and ten fingers at the ends of those hands and come back every afternoon because we have put systems and processes in place to ensure that we take this notion of an acronym HSSE seriously. Health, safety, security, and environment. Much more seriously. When our companies can put people before profits, that's when we know that we are winning. When we can walk around and say our strategy is people first. Because our businesses are not bricks and mortars. Because a company that's inappropriately located can move its headquarters. It's not the products and services we sell or provide. Because those can change. Sony used to make toilets. It's now amongst the top five electronic manufacturers in the world. It's people, the DNA, the ecosystem that is difficult um, to replicate. Because when you are poor on people, you are a dead company. Fourthly, I think we also need to make the world a better place. Not only because... <laughs> We have inherited this world from our forebears, but because we borrowed it from our children, therefore it behooves you, Mike and I, to live it in a state that is substantially better than we found it in. That is how we define progress. Lastly, I think we also need to ensure that we pull our resources because every single solid true one of the companies have as their CSI a component around education. Since when Nasana helped us in creating a national education collaboration trust to say, how can we have an oversized and outsized impact in education and give our people hope? So by being very explicit and intentional about how we use our CSI money around education, I think we can make a huge difference. At the moment, it's fruitless and wasteful expenditure because we spend 30 billion on TVET colleges with a completion rate of 3%. The historical debt of mostly black students is 10 billion, excluding the TVET colleges. One and a half billion is KwaZulu Natal University alone. That's a billion. Mike, back to you. Thank you so much for that comprehensive response to the question. I have a question from Mohamotsi Pule, who asks, how can business assist our government in implementing its policies? Over to you, Benang. Ndate Mohamotsi Comfort Pule, thank you so much for the support, my dear brothers, always. It's genuinely appreciated. You see, it was General George Patton who said, great wars are won by good execution, not great plans. Because good execution will save even your mediocre plan. All of us today accept that the problem with our government is the doing. They have got excellent plans, is the doing, just execution. That's where we fall short. Let me make you an example. I mean, when we became free, we had the most amazing goodwill by all South Africans. We had a plan called the Reconstruction and Development Program, RDP. Today, when you talk to young people, they think RDP is a house during the days of President Holy Sasa Nelson Mandela. We gave it three years. On year four, we changed it to the growth, employment, and redistribution strategy. Gear. When Pumzilem Lamunuga became the deputy president, we then had Asgisa. Then we put some clever people in a room. We called them commissioners. They gave us the new growth path under Minister Ibrahim Patel at that time, resting on four legs. One was, of course, re-industrialization, was the creation of black industrialists, localization and beneficiation. Those were the four things. At the same time, 
We put another 18 people, we call them commissioners, under the Minister of Finance, Trevor Manuel, and they gave us what we regard as our economic blueprint today called the NDP 2030. And it correctly diagnoses our problems and it says, these are the nine things that you have to do. And we haven't done them. Now, the president, who's a member of the same political party, we haven't changed political parties in 26 years, is now giving us an economic reconstruction and recovery plan. The same with our vaccine. We haven't completed the first phase of inoculating the 1.2 million frontline workers who see these exposed patients every hour. Now we're on phase two, but also doing phase 1B. And in total, we still don't have 1.2 million who are just frontline workers. So you can see that it is really about execution. So what can business do to help? I can tell you, the Black Management Forum went to the president and said, we can give you for the 740 state-owned enterprises and state-owned companies, one of our members, not to chair the Audit and Risk Committee, just to be a member, so that there's somebody there who knows the difference between income and cash. Our sister organization is the Association of Black Accountants of Southern Africa, ABASA, that used to be chaired by Mashudu Ramano at that time. We said, we give one member at SAA, at SACS, at Transnet, at ESCOM, at DINER. That was never taken up. Now we know because had they taken those people up, they would not have been able to siphon off on average 20 billion a year every year in the nine wasted years just to the two Zupta families. Today, business has said, yes, government can procure the vaccines, for sure. But give them to us and then we'll give them to our people because especially in mining, when we were under a let level five national lockdown, mines were open. They came from Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Botswana, and Namibia. We know how to screen them, how to isolate them, how to self-quarantine them, and we can roll out these vaccines in a month. But we insist on hanging on to it because we care about who takes their credit. Therefore, the major constraint today towards achieving the 40 million health immunity target that has been set by the president it's not the availability of the vaccines, no, because we still have vaccines that we haven't used. It's not vaccine nationalism. No, it's not. Let's use the ones that we have and then go and lobby um, the World Health Organization on trips to relax the intellectual property of these research and development uh, entities. We can put books in beer trucks to be delivered. We can put vaccines in refrigerated trucks of some of the log logistics companies. Why Deben should be the third from the bottom and such congestion when we could have experimented with Richard Bayes um, and, and to move cargo. When you look at the Transnet plans today, they are saying we are the infrastructure backbone of the country. But you know what? We are going to turn Devon into just a container terminal because we can make more money from terminals. You are, you are threatening food security. You are also threatening <laughs> energy security, especially because energy is the fourth means of production. The five refineries that we have, four of them are located there, including Sapref, which is the biggest at 180,000 barrels per day. That allows us to sell 7.2 million liters a day of the 20 billion liters that we make locally, the 10 billion that we import. Mike, back to you. Thank you so much for that comprehensive response, Bonang. I have a question from Pia Ulifir of Hatch Africa. We constantly hear that business should do more in education, upliftment, and other social issues, including now vaccinations. Normally, business contribute taxes to government to address these issues. But in South Africa, we have a bigger responsibility. 
how do you think this impacts businesses' ability to perform and grow? Is there perhaps a better way, i.e. increased taxes and less government intervention? Thank you for that question, Pierre. So Pierre is absolutely right, especially the last piece. So the Scandinavian countries have the highest happiness index. Their citizens on average are taxed at 50%. But then education is free. Healthcare is free. Security is free. Those three. These are the fundamental human rights enshrined in our own constitution. Also in the United Nations Charter for Human Rights. And we are unable to do so. In South Africa, it's much more expensive to live because the marginal tax rate for high net worth individuals is 45%. So you think it's less than 50%. And you add on to that 15% VAT for everything you buy, from cars to houses to white goods. That's already about 50%. As if that's not enough. In South Africa, when you leave, even in Soweto, Langanyanga and Guguletu, Emonjo and Nkandla in the dusty hills of KwaZulu Natal, you have to provide your own security because South African police services are not going to protect you. You have to belong to a private medical scheme because healthcare is not free. You have to provide for your own children's tertiary education because education is not free. In spite of what we resolved on the 25th to the 27th of June, 1955 in Clip Town with the Freedom Charter, 10 principles. The fifth principle says the doors of learning and culture shall be free. 27 years later, we still have not been able to provide free education. So it's hard to be a business person in South Africa. In fact, I was looking at the World Report um, about three months ago. It said South Africa has the highest failure rate of small and medium enterprises in the world. This over and above the fact that when you compare us with our BRICS counterparts, new jobs being created are more than 60% in the BRICS countries in South Africa, less than 15%. How can businesses be asked to do more under those circumstances when they're already overtaxed. It's because we are patriots. Had you put a thousand rands 10 years ago into the Fortune 500, today that would be 3,500. That same thousand rand, you've put it in the JSE, today it's 650. I mean, that says everything. Let me conclude, Pierre, by saying you know, if you look at the total people that are medical aid, because we're talking about vaccines, 16.4% of the population only belongs to medical aid. The others don't. It gives the medical aid a maximum liability of $7 billion. But to the medical aid, it's only 2% of all premiums. So all the medical aids, if you gave them the vaccines today, because they are heavily invested in this, they'll ensure that within a month all their members are vaccinated. Adrian Gore's of Discovery has already said so. But also if you look at other bigger companies, I'll make an example with the Bidvest Group Limited of which I chair. Before unbundling our food businesses, which are mostly global, and we listed them separately, we call them Bidcorp. Pre-COVID, we had 135,000 employees seven divisions, we have reduced them now to six. We retrenched slightly less than 10,000 because of COVID. Today, I would say 105,000 employees. But we have 350 companies. 250 of them are operating entities. 250 CEOs. It needs Nompu Melelo, Mpu, Nitembe, Kile, Madisa, one phone call to talk to these 250 CEOs in the course of the morning to say, help with just the employees that work for you. Lastly, we did that when the government was saying, we're going to open the schools in Houghton alone. We need to fumigate um, and make sure that at least they are, they are cleaned. And we said we have 75,000 of our people that are sitting at home. 
we can do that for free. And we provided not only the labor, but the chemicals for free. And yet the Gauteng government still went on to issue tenders of 413 million. And there's a WhatsApp meme that's doing the round that says, solidarity <coughs> has built an entire technical <laughs> university for 300 million. For 430 million, we couldn't even clean um, the Houghton schools. Back to you, Mike. Thanks so much, Bonang. Just a reminder to all, please, that you can also use the raise your hand facility for questions, but we still have the best part of 13 minutes. Bonang has agreed to stay with us right until 12, Bonang. Thank you for that. I have a question from Craig Sumption of Hatch. It reads, it doesn't sound like you believe our current government can make the changes required. What chance do you see of a changing government? We're putting you on the spot there, Benang. <laughs> I can see Hatch is very active. And Hatch, thanks for, for coming in great numbers. So I'm a patriot. I have only one passport. I don't have a second one. So we have to make this country work. But to make it work, it's a realization that the politicians work for us, not the other way around. So when the politicians walk through the room, we stand up to attention as if they are our masters. We pay their salaries. Therefore, we should demand three things from our politicians. One, ethical leadership, which is tautologous, because leadership can be anything else other than ethical. But for emphasis, ethical leadership. We need absolute transparency. At the moment, there is no transparency about the procurement of these vaccines. When we started phase two, we had not issued the tenders for the logistics of these vaccines. How are they going to be moved from here to East London and to Port Elizabeth? There's no transparency, absolute transparency. And then lastly, this notion of final accountability. When you have taken things that don't belong to you, that's how we are brought up. You must be sent to prison. So we have lots of faith in the presidency of Matamela, Sir Ramaphosa, because he's not our second chance. He's our last chance. My grandmother, as I close, Mike, used to tell me a story that, you know, the trees continue to vote for the X, even though the X chops them. And their numbers are coming down. And the only excuse is that, but the X is made of wood, therefore, one. We got the people who gave us Uhuru are not the same people who call themselves our leaders today. That but the leaders we have today are stealing from the mouth of the study, but also from the mouths of the children. You give them as business poor of the poorest, and they give 10%, and the rest, they use it for, for, for getting votes. Some of them have even opened spaza shops to sell the very same things that they're supposed to share with their own people. Back to you, Mike. Thank you so much, uh, Craig. Thank you for that question. And thanks to Hatch for the uh, for turning out in numbers, as Bonang says. Thank you, guys. I have a question here from uh, from Second Champ, from Oriel, who says, Bonang, do you see a future of recovery for businesses who are now straining under current conditions, recovering during COVID activity? Funny enough, there are still lots of opportunities even in these unusually deadly times and deadly times, they are. Let's remind ourselves that liberal democracy rests on four pillars. The first pillar is a free press. The second one is a constitutional democracy where the constitution is the supreme law. Number three is an active and independent civil society. Lastly, is, is the rule of law. So, 
So our salvation, like our is going to bring us to end them, that should take out the garbage and make sure that sewage is working. M. Fulen municipalities, there were 26 pumps, every single solid through one of them is broken. Raw sewage pours into the Val water system, including the Val Dam at the barrage and the Val River. And if you live in Buipato and in the black townships around the Val, raw sewage is in your yard. Your kids are developing sores. You have to walk on bricks from your kitchen to the toilet that is still outside. Under those circumstances, why then do you continue to elect the same leaders that are disappointing you so much? Today, as I conclude, Mike, we have on average seven service delivery protests a day, every day. Thanks, Mike. Thank you so much again for that comprehensive response. Um, are you good for another five minutes, Benang? I know you're under time pressure. Are you good for another five? I could never be under time pressure when you have asked me so nicely, Mike, and you said you are providing lunch. So, of course, I'll give you five minutes. We'll have to take this conversation offline, Benang. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question from Sam Alefi of Modi Mining. It reads, please advise what sort of incentives are available or should be made available by government for emerging companies that employ more than 700 people on a permanent basis, contributing towards our country's revenue collection through PAYE, VAT, uh, income tax, and so forth. Your response to that, Bruno, please? Brother Sam, in your question also, therein lies the answer. <laughs> Let me come up for it. So, Singapore <laughs> is a benevolent dictatorship. Lee Kuan Yew, 40 years, top five per capita income in the world. And they did it by focusing on three things and three things only. One, this thing called meritocracy. Number two, pragmatism. Three, honesty. That's all. You do something you shouldn't do in Singapore, they put you in jail. It doesn't matter whether you are called prime minister. And we have Paul Kagame looking at this model and say, I shouldn't try to look clever. On the 27th of April, 1994, when South Africans were in the long snake queues, ushering in the democracy that gave them their first democratically elected uh, Mandela. 800,000 Tutsis were killed by the Hutus. At the end of the month, it was a million. But in terms of Wi-Fi, it access, public transport. 20 years. That's all. Germany did the same thing, by the way, in integrating its German 20 years. It was a single unitary, but man, give small and medium enterprises. In Singapore, you can open a new business in two hours. You have registered for tax, you are compliant, and you've got a clearance certificate. Try doing that in two years in South Africa. The cost will be half a million rand. And you are starting... A, a new business that will create jobs. What they also do, because they know that SMEs create more new jobs than big established businesses, they make sure that they don't pay tax. Here, if you're an SME, you have to comply with all the laws, including BE laws and anti-competitive laws that says no market allocation, no collusion, no price fixing, which is good. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying we're not giving them a special dispensation that says, because you are young and small, you don't have to worry about issues of ownership. You don't have to worry about issues of compliance with the prudential authority when you are in financial services. You don't have to worry about the four control functions of the risk of compliance of 
Book internal audit and of a tutorial if you are in financial service. I think they could move they said because you know, the is where you are. If you are in so way to it's three and a half million people officially. This is more than the population of the old SACU um, trade block. Botswana, Lesotho, Namibia, and Eswati, because each one of those have, on average, about 2 million people. So Soweto is bigger than countries. We gave the malls killing black shop owners in the townships. Instead of saying, actually, yes, open up malls in Katlehong, Togoza, and Fosiloras, but the ownership shall be by these black shopkeepers, because they are the ones that are going be deleteriously affected. The gambling licenses were in the old homelands. Puputatwana had the most. This ANC-led government had an opportunity to issue new licenses, and it gave them to the usual suspects. Instead of saying, you know what, we'll form cooperatives. The people of Limpopo, you own this license. The people of the Eastern Cape, because three presidents came from there, of the ANC, but it's still... The second from the bottom, you will own this license. It will be given to you, and then you can create some economic activity. Lastly, Brasem, I think a simple statement translated into policy that says, as black people, we must build our own businesses and hire our own children because it's madness to continue to make babies and send them to a different neighborhood to go down on their knees to somebody else begging for a job. Especially because the altruism of this world was created from Transnet. Most blue-collar workers that now, that owned houses in Leondale and Don Park where Chris Hani was assassinated and Windmill Park that uh, was newly built where Fetus and tenors, mirrors, and lift mechanics. That's not. What are we training? My grandmother used to say, when fisher women can't go out to sea for whatever reason, they repair <laughs> We've been free for 27 years. We have been if we focus on small and medium enterprise, not micro, because uh, um, and, 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 and tomatoes and potatoes, that's not business, that's survivalist. We're not even talking about those. What are we doing to make life easy for them uh, so that they create jobs? If each of the SMEs hired only three people, three people each, our unemployment will move from 35% to 16. Mike, back to you. Thank you so much for that, Benang. We don't appear to have any more questions in the chat facility. Do you have any online, Ariel? Sorry about that. It took a little while for my mute to come off. Um, I don't have any more questions. We can maybe move on to the summary. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Benang, I'm not going to do this event justice by attempting to, to thank you and to acknowledge the constructive, well-researched and incisive insight of our partners. In fact, folks, it is you who contribute to the success of an event like this by your robust participation, by the questions you pose. So from my side, thank you so much. Without any further ado, I'm going to call on, on Edwin just to uh, do the concluding remarks and a vote of thanks. Uh, Edwin, thank you so much for stepping up. Over to you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, Bonang, my dear friend, I am always in awe with your eloquence and incredible insights and your generosity has no bounds in the information that you so freely share every time, whether it is on LinkedIn, the books you pen, or the talks you give. And so 
I must just reflect upon one of several of the points that you so eloquently highlighted and one that brings great smile to my face was not only the emphasis of education at a time of tremendous social and economic discourse in the world and in our country, but the fact that, as you pointed out, the, even the Scandinavian countries have provided a strong correlation for us between education and happiness. And I think that when one wishes people good health and happiness, it is the everything else that will follow from that. So a tremendous thanks to you for your generosity, for the insights that you've provided. And I think also the leadership today of socioeconomic transformation alone, the magnitude of the challenge is far greater than any one brand or individual. And so I really hope that many of us take away today the opportunities presented by you through the insights and knowledge you've shared to collaborate and partner in addressing this huge chasm before us. Thank you, Wanang. I really do appreciate it, as the rest of us do. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking on our behalf there, Edwin. Uh, in closing then, Bonang, once again from my side personally, thank you so much for agreeing so readily to address us. Uh, and then from a second chair, if I may be forgiven a little advertorial, please folks, we have an exciting lineup of, of speakers of the caliber we hope, of Benang. So please look out for your our communications, our next newsletter, and also do visit our website at www.secondchan.com to keep abreast of what we are doing and our activities. So to the rest of you, have a wonderful day. All the best. And again, Benang, thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye now. Bye.